Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you all for deciding to spend some of your time with us. We know you have lots of options. This is gorgeous San Diego. We're finally in spring. It stopped raining. And here you are in Salk's Auditorium. So I really very much appreciate that. I see some of our partners in research, people who have included us in their estate plans. Thank you very much, um, some other donors. We are very appreciative of all that you do for us because the work of our scientists would not be possible without your support. Uh, I'm Cheryl Dean. I have been here at Salk for over 10 years, which makes me fairly junior <laughs> compared to some folks. Um, but I've loved every minute of it. I've learned tons, and it's really been great to be able to meet some people um, such as yourselves. So my role here is Plan Giving Council. I work with people who are interested in supporting Salk through their estate plans. And um, actually just last week, put together a gift annuity for somebody, which gives you income for the rest of your lifetime. So anybody interested or who hasn't let us know that we are in their estate plans, please, we are happy to always welcome new people into our legacy society. And if you're just learning um, about us for the very first time, we hope that we will present some absolutely just intriguing and positive, hopeful information. Show of hands, how many people are here for the first time? Okay, a few of you. Well, welcome. So glad that you were able to make your way to Salk. Um, before I introduce our speakers today, though, um, you're aware that the general theme is cancer for this afternoon's lecture. So I would like to have um, a brief screening of a, about a five-minute film about Salk's very ambitious new cancer initiative. So that'll put some context in, in place for the speakers that you'll be hearing this afternoon. We genuinely come up with ideas that other places do not come up with. This has been the case, this has been the history of the Salk Institute, and this continues to be the case, and we are all pushing the boundaries of our research to go someplace that no one has gone before. Cancer affects 40% of the population. This means the odds of anyone having a close relative or a loved one develop cancer in their lifetime is nearly universal. This is something we simply can't escape. Even when we do have the top scientific treatments and the best tailored, personalized therapeutics, if a cancer is quite advanced, it has this insidious way of altering and mutating itself like a virus around whatever you treat it with and develops resistance and comes back and lives to fight you another day. The goal of the Conquering Cancer Initiative is for Salk researchers to really focus on the five deadliest cancers. And uh, these are pancreatic, glioblastoma, deadly brain cancer, triple negative breast cancer, lung cancer, and ovarian cancer. In searching for therapeutics that will work best on these cancers, we will have a cascading effect uh, and end up developing treatments for other forms of cancer. We have a, a history of fundamental cancer research at the Institute, beginning with the work of Renato Becco on tumor viruses, for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1975. The, the SOC has a, a, a track record of uh, developing its uh, science into uh, new drugs for, for cancer therapy. Uh, for instance, uh, my discovery of the tyrosine kinases led to the development of Gleevec as a, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that's used to treat a particular type, type of leukemia. In 2006, I was diagnosed with a form of uh, CML 
which is chronic myelogenous leukemia. I had discovered later that uh, one of the top researchers here at SALT, Tony Hunter, had done the foundational work to uh, actually unlock a big part of what made Gleevec so successful. Our goal is to, to tackle these five deadly cancers, for each of which little progress has been made uh, in the last uh, many years. And I think by, by working on these different cancers, we will learn basic principles that can be used for treatment of, of all types of cancer. And I'm sure we'll discover new biology along the way, which is really going to be, I think, from my perspective, the most exciting thing. At Salk, we really encourage uh, and enable our scientists to cut across disciplines and to come up with really out of the box unexpected ways to go after and chase down various diseases. Cancer has been so challenging to combat for decades, uh, in part because it's smarter than us. And we need to understand the basic principles of how cancer evades our ability to fight it. So evasion, in one word, is what I think cancer is spectacular at doing and its ability to evade the normal rules of tissue function, its ability to evade virtually every drug we've thrown at cancer, and its ability to evade the immune system, which is something that I study and have a lot of interest in trying to understand how we can better engineer our immune system to fight cancer. One of the biggest challenges that we face in the field of cancer immunology is understanding why our immune system can't recognize and destroy the cancer cells. As one strategy of the Cancer Initiative, we're taking a computational approach, which hasn't received as much attention over the years, but it takes advantage of these decades of data um, that are difficult to synthesize, but if we actually study them you know, thoroughly the way we believe they behave, we can come up with new observations, uh, new findings that would not have been obvious otherwise. So it adds a whole new approach to study the cancer problem. We think this approach can be a, a unique perspective to personalized medicine. We can come up with new ideas for how different patients should be targeted based off their mutations. That goes beyond traditional approaches. We believe that we have never been poised in the way we are now to truly come up with unique combinations of therapies. The goal here is, is nothing short of attacking each individual's cancers with a cocktail of tailored therapeutics attacking epigenetics, attacking metabolism, reprogramming the outside of the cell, going after the DNA itself to combinatorially eliminate, destroy the tumors before there is enough time for individual clones of the cancer to grow out and to come back later as a relapse. That is the goal and so we believe that this is the time for conquering cancer and for conquering cancer at the Salk Institute. So as I mentioned a minute ago, uh, quite ambitious, um, but if you don't aim high, you won't hit them. And we've got an amazing team here. You will be meeting two of them today who are working on our cancer program. So our first speaker today is Dr. Jeff Wall. And way back when, Jeff received his BA in bacterial biology at UCLA. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not gonna give you the whole thing. Your uh, PhD in biological chemistry at Harvard, did a postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford, and we've been fortunate to have him at Salk since 1979. He was joking for me being a newbie at only 10 years here, so. Uh, he's a professor in the Gene Expression Lab, holds the Daniel and Martina Lewis Chair. Uh, you saw Dan Lewis, he's the chair of our board. And um, Jeff is the past president of the American Association for Cancer Research. His many awards over the decades include being a Susan B. Komen Scholar and being a fellow at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Association of Cancer Research, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I'm not even going to try to give an overview of all of his awards, all of his research and accomplishments, or I'd be up here for the full hour. I'm sure you'd much prefer to hear from him directly, but I will let you know if he's a tiny bit distracted today, it's because any minute he could become a grandfather. So um, 
this is Jeff, and then the other um, person who we have presenting today is one of our newest employees in a certain way, Dr. Danny Engel. She received her BA in Biological Sciences and Asian Studies from Northwestern University before receiving her PhD in Biological Sciences at UCSD, during which time she did a great part of her lab work here at Salk and in fact in uh, Jeff Wall's lab. So they've known each other for many years and I'm happy to say that I've known Danny and she's a wonderful person. Um, once she earned her PhD, she went on to do two postdoctoral fellowships, one at the Cambridge Research Institute and then a Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And now we're extremely pleased to have her back here, hopefully for a very long time, as an assistant professor in the Regulatory Bio Biology Laboratory. Danny uses her personal and scientific passion, as well as her expertise in modeling, to facilitate progress in pancreatic cancer research by creating better representations of what actually happens in patients. The identification of biomarkers and therapeutic targets has been hindered by the limited access to pure sample populations and accurate models. When looking at a patient's blood samples, there can be hidden signals from all over the body. And Danny tackles these challenges by using stem cell techniques to create more accurate models of pancreatic disease, as well as biochemistry mythology to identify biomarkers that unambiguously differentiate between pancreatic cancer and other inflammatory conditions. And as if that doesn't keep her busy enough, when she's not in the lab, she enjoys going on hikes with her husband and two corgis. So we've got two amazing researchers here today and two wonderful individual human beings. Please help me welcome Dr. Jeff Wall and then Dr. Danny Engel. Is this on? Okay. Um, I want to thank Cheryl for that very uh, wonderful introduction. I hope I'm not going to get a text in the middle saying <laughs> I'm now a grandpa. <laughs> Don't know what I'd be able to do if I did. Um, and I want to thank you all for being here and for your interest in the SALK. Uh, this is a really um, a special time for me as well. Uh, when you're um, a faculty member, uh, you become very fortunate um, in mentoring people from undergraduates or graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. And today is unique because my, literally, my last graduate student, she will be the last, she was the last one, is the only person to have ever been trained at Salk and then rehired here. And she wasn't rehired here because of me, she was rehired here because of her brilliance. So, we are really fortunate, and, and I feel very proud that she's here and that we were able to attract her back. So today I'm going to um, give you just a brief um, summary of some of the work that we're doing on conquering cancer's complexities. Uh, as Sue Keck said, evasion is the rule in cancer. Um, Darwin actually didn't say that... Um, it was a survival of the fittest. And he also didn't say that um, it wasn't the smartest or the bravest that survived, but the most adaptive. That was actually said by Leon Meganson. But that can be applied to cancer. It is the most adaptive of all diseases. It is able to evade both our natural um, antagonists in the immune system, as well as the drugs that we can throw at it. And we shouldn't call it an it. We should call it a set of diseases that are as individual as the people who have them. And that's how we must treat them. And that is, I think, where the success from the Salk Institute will come, because we treat the cancers through their individual molecular components. And when I took this picture, I've been here for 40 years, and I've been waiting a long time to find an image like this. And um, as I was standing in the rain, actually with Chris Emery, our, our photographer, um, struggling to get the exposure right, something suddenly occurred to me. And that is that as the water is coming in from each side to create that river of inspiration down the middle, this is the secret of the salt. It is the combination of ideas from disparate disciplines 
and the free exchange of that information and communication that enable us to think about things in new ways. In a huge university, you might see your colleagues only infrequently, but one of Jonas Salk's brilliant ideas was that every Friday we should have a lunch together. And as many of the faculty as can make it always come to that lunch and we're always talking about science. And in those discussions come new ideas. So I think that as you see this picture and as you hear this talk, I think you'll hear that inspiration coming through. So uh, you saw that wonderful video um, on our Conquering Cancer Initiative. Um, as Ruben Shaw said, we're tackling five of the most uh, dangerous cancers. They're all dangerous. We're tackling five of them because of the size of our faculty. And today we're going to talk about two. Danny is going to be talking about pancreatic cancer. Actually, there's a group of about 30 faculty here who are members of our um, cancer center at Salk. It is only one of the seven or eight NCI-designated basic cancer centers in the United States. We're fortunate to have one of them. And in that group of 30 people, four of us work on pancreatic cancer. Tony Hunter, who you saw in the video, Danny Engel, our newest member, myself, and Ron Evans. And in that group of four, we already have two clinical trials going. And one of the objectives of the Conquering Cancer Initiative is to move discoveries from the laboratory to the clinic as rapidly as possible. And those discoveries that have made their way into clinical trials in pancreatic cancer have had a lag time from the lab to the clinic of only about five years, which I think is absolutely remarkable. And so we're trying to do that more and more, and we are going to be empowered to do that through the funds raised at the Conquering Cancer Initiative. And you can contact Sandy Laracos, who's here, um, to talk about that. I'm going to focus on breast cancer and specifically triple negative breast cancer, trying to understand it better and treat it more effectively. So first, let me give you just a few basic facts about breast cancer, which you may already be familiar with. It is the second leading cause of cancer death among women, the first being lung cancer, uh, because lung cancer is so prevalent. Um, about um, almost 300,000 cases of breast cancer will be diagnosed this year in the United States alone. Uh, and what you may not be aware of is that about 1% of the total cases will be in men. So men can get breast cancer as well. Um, among the uh, total number of cases, about there, there will be about 42,000 deaths. Now those are not deaths that are caused by cancer diagnosed within one year. Breast cancer actually is among the most successfully treated of all cancers, and I'll explain some reasons for that in just a minute. But rather, it's the cumulative deaths over time is about 42,000. You can see the great majority is in women because they are most susceptible to it, but again, about the same percentage of men who get the disease will also die of it. So it's a very serious disease in men as well. Now, importantly, and I'll get to this uh, in my talk, uh, the vast majority of the people who will die of breast cancer do not die of local disease. Rather, they die because of the movement of the cancer cells from the mammary gland, the breast, to distant sites in the body, the brain, the liver, the bones. This is what causes death. And as I'll show you, that's the problem we really have to attack, and it's, an, it's a problem that's not being attacked at too many places. We're doing it here. And finally, successes in breast cancer treatment have come from increased knowledge of the genetic defects that are present within the cancers in each individual person. That's where the successes come from. Let me explain to you why. So we can break breast cancers broadly into three or four different subtypes. And those subtypes are typically designated by the molecular characteristics that will tell the doctors what kind of drugs to use to treat them. So broadly speaking, there's a large group, the most common group of breast cancers is called um, a luminal group. The reason it's called luminal is because, as you know, the mammary gland is a gland that's specialized. Its job is to make milk. And the way that it delivers milk to the baby, and I hope I'm going to see one soon, <laughs> Um, the way that it delivers milk to the baby is through a ductal system. And the ducts have two kinds of cells in them. There's an outer muscle-like cell that we call a basal cell. 
and then an inner cell that's called a luminal cell. And the reason it's called luminal is because it, it faces this hollow part that's called a lumen. So the mammary gland is a simple organ, have two kinds of cells, basal on the outside, luminal on the inside, and each of those can get cancer. So the kind that um, is most common is the luminal cell. These are the most numerous cells within the mammary gland. And interestingly, these cells, the proliferation, the division of these cells is fueled by hormones, by estrogen and progesterone. These cells have receptors for those two hormones, the estrogen receptor and the progesterone receptor. And if you know that a person has luminal breast cancer that express those genes, those receptors, then we can develop, we have drugs already available that either prevent the synthesis of estrogen or prevent the interaction of estrogen with their receptors. And consequently, those drugs are good for treatment of women with only this kind of breast cancer, just this one. Wouldn't do any good for any of the other ones, except if they express estrogen receptor or progesterone receptor. Now, there's a second class of breast cancers, and that one is called HER2 positive. Why is it called HER2 positive? The reason for that is that HER2 is an acronym for Human Estrogen Related Receptor 2, so we just call it HER2. Now, uh, it's not HER2 like she has it. No, it's HER2 because that's the gene. What's important about this gene? Well, Dennis Slayman, some years ago, developed an antibody to that gene, and that antibody is not showing up here. So can't help me with this. I think we've got some problem. Anyway, I'll just advance it this way. No, I won't, because my slide is stuck. How about that way? Nope, doesn't work either. Thank you, Kent. We have a wonderful uh, crew here. Uh, yeah, so there's a drug that's called Herceptin. That was the first drug. Now we have many, many, many other drugs that can work against tumors of this type. So if the tumor expresses HER2 elevated levels of it, that tumor is dependent upon um, that protein for its proliferation and survival. We can treat a person with Herceptin or other receptors other inhibitors of that receptor to kill the cells. It's not quite that simple. And the reason is because these tumors are very heterogeneous. The cells within the tumor, some of the cells express this gene and some of them don't. That's a problem of genetic instability that I've spoken about previously but I won't speak about today. Importantly, because of this, what we call intratumoral, within the tumor heterogeneity differences in cells, we have to treat these patients not only with these um, receptor antagonists, but also typically with chemotherapy. So the chemotherapy will take care of the cells that don't have the receptor. The Herceptin will take care of the cells that do have the receptor. Together, they do a much better job than either alone. And that double treatment has caused cancers of this type to turn from what used to be the most aggressive and lethal form of breast cancer into one that has the very best long-term prognosis. That's the power of giving a cancer a molecular name and having an effective treatment for it. Okay, these two cancers, uh, two types of cancers constitute about 75 to 80% of human breast cancer in the United States. Well, what about this other one? Doesn't have estrogen receptor, doesn't have progesterone receptor, it doesn't have uh, noticeable expression of HER2, Consequently, it's called triple negative. Negative, negative, negative. Does that give you any idea of how to treat it? No, you have to give it a name. Or you have to treat it with a generic type of strategy. And that's why these patients are often treated with strong chemotherapies, agents that kill not only the cancer cells but other cells in your body, they typically have very good responses to those agents, but they often recur, and they recur with metastatic disease. And it's that metastatic disease that kills them. That's what we have to attack. So we have to do two things. We have to give the negative, negative, negative cancer a name to tell us how to treat it, and we have to understand why those cancers metastasize. Okay. Here is an idea, a new idea that we started on, actually that Danny Engel started on, about 10 years ago. And that is, 
Uh, my wife is a, is a breast oncologist. Many of you know her, Barbara Parker. When I was talking to her about triple negative, she said, oh, the pathologists call that the least differentiated of the breast cancers. In other words, they're the most primitive looking. And so I started to think about this and started to read some old literature. Um, I didn't read this because it was in Italian. It was from 1874. But the translation is very informative. Durante, a pathologist, said elements, read that as cancers, or cancer cells which have retained their embryonal characteristics, the most primitive characteristics that the cell have, in the adult, or have regained them through some chemico-physiologic deviation represent the generative elements of every tumor variety and specifically those of a malignant nature, the ones that metastasize. Such elements may remain enclosed within mature tissues for many years, giving no indication of their presence until an irritation Think about that as inflammation. Rekindles their vital cellular activities. So in 1874, only using a microscope, Durante said, oh, cancers could resemble their early embryonic antecedents. They can become dormant for many, many years until they're acted upon by a persistent inflammation, whereupon they can reactivate those primitive characteristics, or even, he kind of said here, have regained them he almost anticipated the idea of cellular reprogramming that's only been proven in the last five years for which a Nobel Prize was given. This idea of cell state plasticity, these are the problems. This is one of the ways that cancers become so adaptive. So is this idea at all true? And in order to investigate it, what you have to do is you have to go back to the beginning. You have to go back to that stem cell that creates the mammary gland to begin with. That's the most embryonic or rudimentary cell. So let me explain to you what a stem cell is and you'll understand the problem. So here's a seed. A seed is a stem cell of a tree. Now, if I take other seeds from this tree after it grows and I replant them, you get another tree. That's one of the cardinal characteristics of a stem cell. So in the mammary gland, here's a mouse. Mouse has 10 mammary glands, five on each side. If you have a, the right, if there is a stem cell for the mammary gland, which I assure you there is, if we isolate that cell and we inject it into the right location, which would be the fat pad, which is where the mammary gland grows, then after some period of time, these cells will grow out and they will generate a tree. And this is actually one of Danny's results that she got. And then the second characteristic is if we took some cells from this tree and then we re-injected them, they would grow into another tree. And they do. So this gives you the two characteristics of stem cells. One, they give rise, a single cell will give rise to all cells of the mature organ in a functional way. And secondly, they're able to self-renew themselves. Okay? So again, the question is, are there stem cells in the embryo for the mammary gland? And do these cells represent any of the cells that are present in any human breast cancer, such as Durante had predicted? Here's the problem. This is a really hard experiment, never done before, because the the, the uh, material is so limiting that you have to deal with. So here's a mouse, an embryonic mouse. And what you can see lit up there are three of the five mammary rudiments. To give you an idea of scale of size, there's a penny. How many of you still have pennies that you deal with? Probably not. Oh, there's one. OK, keep it. <laughs> you may not have looked carefully, but Lincoln is sitting in the middle of his monument. And his head is about the same size as one of these rudiments. So that's how small they are. So you have to be very patient. You have to really work out in order to be able to isolate enough of these in order to take the cells and analyze them molecularly to answer the questions that I've posed to you. So we work out. So that's Danny at my house, and we're doing wee boxing, getting ready for this heroic experiment. And after a few years, uh, this is what we found. We took apart every stage of, uh, of uh, mammogenesis, the genesis of the mammary gland in the mouse from early embryonic stages through adult. We isolated these cells, and then going through lots of experiments that I won't describe, we found, lo and behold, that in the embryo, there were stem cells, had all the characteristics that I just described to you. They become very abundant just before birth, and then after birth, they become almost undetectable. Right? They're there, and they disappear. And I can explain to you good reason why that would be true later on. And then, going through years of work that we just published, we isolated these cells. We identified the genes that they express. We call them F-mask for fetal 
mammary stem cell. We always have to have abbreviations. And then we ask, do these, the genes that are expressed in these cells, do they correspond to the genes that are expressed in any of the human breast cancers that I've talked to you about? So we did that experiment, and we found out, lo and behold, that the no-name cancers actually should be named fetal mammary stem cell-like cancers. That fits with what the pathologists were telling us. They're very undifferentiated. OK, so now we have given it a name. What does that do for us? Here, I want to turn to this important topic of metastasis, because this is what kills people. So 90% of all morbidity in cancer is due to metastasis. And you may have re read a paper uh, in Fortune magazine 2014 by Clifton Leaf who said, we're losing the war on cancer. Well, why is that? Well, one of the reasons is, look at this. If you just do a search, you find that 92% of all grants don't even mention the word metastasis. 92% of, of, of grants that are on cancer don't mention the word metastasis. Less than 5% of the funding goes to the study of metastasis, and I can tell you why. It's really hard to do those studies. So uh, even in our preclinical models, most people don't even set up models that can look at metastasis. So this readily explains why we're losing the war if we're not studying the right problem. So the good news is that with effective treatments and better diagnoses, um, many women are living for very long times, even with metastatic disease, but they will eventually die of their disease through recurrence in a dangerous organ site. So imagine if, this is always the question that I'm asking, Danny can tell you that, imagine if we could do something, imagine if we could intercept metastatic cancer. What might the effects be? How will we do that? Okay, so we get ideas from the, well, those who have come before us. And Hal Dvorak came here to give a talk. We invited him here this year. And he said, he reminded us, tumors are really wounds that are always trying to heal, but they never succeed. They're the ever healing wound. They're disruptions of an organ that's creating the inflammation that Durante was telling you about. And it's the, 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 in, the exposure to those inflammatory stimuli that are really causing a problem. So let's think about the cancer not as a bunch of aberrant cells in, 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 in one organ by themselves, but rather as an ecosystem, an aberrant ecosystem, where you have the, the cancer cells interacting with fibroblasts and immune cells in this whole deranged system where the cells that are supposed to be in one place end up moving somewhere else. And how do they do that? Well, here's normal cells. Let's imagine these as mammary cells. They get a mutation. That causes a state of transformation where the cells now gain the ability to grow. This forms a, a primary tumor. The primary tumor is OK because it's separated from the blood vessel, which is the, the part where it's going to get transited to other parts of the body, by a basement membrane. Now, cells gain the ability to break through this membrane, and that's where the danger comes in. And this can be stimulated by the inflammatory uh, microenvironment, the inflammatory environment of the tumor itself. This then can cause invasion to occur. And once the cells gain the ability to invade, they can get into a blood vessel in a process called entravisation. If they survive the blood vessel journey, which is very difficult, but some of them do it, then they can get out by a process called extravasation. And if they have the right genetic composition and are able to respond to their new environment appropriately, they can form a clone, a metastatic tumor, where they can recruit the blood vessels. So how do we intercept this? Well, let's go back to the embryo. There's this incredible period in early embryogenesis where the mammary rudiment is initially encased, and then these cells gain the ability to invade through the uh, a, a protective layer that surrounds them and lodge into the fat pad. Doesn't that sound like just what I told you about? So the embryo has kind of learned how to do this already to form this rudimentary arborization that you see before birth. To make a long story short, We've kind of looked at this process in great detail. We've isolated a lot of the genes that are involved in it. And we came up with one. It's a critical cell state regulator. And it has the quaint name SOX10. It's not like two SOX. It's like 10 of them, 10 SOX, SOX10. That's just what it's called. It's a member of a gene family called the SOX family that's involved in many stages, many phases of development uh, in our body as well as in the body of mice. 
And what was very intriguing to us in this was that this gene is activated by wound factors. And in response to wound factors, normal cells that have SOX10 in them can be induced to move. And you can see that here. See the cells moving, watch where this arrow is, they just start to shoot out. Those cells have high SOX10 in them, and they're able to move. And that begged the question of, well, what happens in tumors? Does the same thing happen? Well, we made tumors. And we made tumors in a way that we could distinguish cells that had high levels of SOX10 from those that had low. The cells that have high SOX10 are red. Those that have low are green. And look at this. Here's the boundary of the tumor. And here's these red cells that have high SOX10. They've moved outside. Well, why is that? Well, it turns out that these cells did what Durante told us. They've reprogrammed themselves. They've changed their state. They've turned into a kind of cell that we normally see in the embryo called a neural crest cell. The neural crest cell is a cell that's found in the notochord, like the primitive um, spinal cord, and then it moves up into the brain. They move into your skin where they form melanocytes, and they, form, and they move to different organs where they form different components of different organs. So this is a cell formed in the embryo that's destined to move. And the mammary cells, in response to a wound, have changed their state into something that looks like these. OK, well, what does that tell us? It's all kind of interesting from an intellectual level, but does it do anything for us for metastatic cancer? Well, we looked at all the genes that were regulated by SOX10, since it is a transcriptional regulator, regulates, regulates the expression of many genes. And look at this. It regulates a gene called KIT. I think you've heard of KIT before. It is a target, the first target that was developed for Gleevec, the gene, the drug that Tony Hunter talked to you about. Oh, that's kind of interesting. So we look in human cancers, and it turns out that a substantial number of these triple negative, these fetal mammary stem cell-like cancers have high levels of SOX10. They also have high levels of KIT. And so Chris Dravis in the lab said, OK, what if I knock it out? What happens to the ability of mammary cancers to form in the mouse? And it turns out it's greatly disabled. Not prevented, but really turned down. And so now what we're doing is we're using the best new derivatives of this drug, Gleevec, to target KIT to try to intercept metastatic breast cancer. So just lessons learned, and I'll finish. Um, one. I don't call it basic science. It's anything but basic. It is the acquisition of foundational knowledge. It's the acquisition of that knowledge that enables us to understand why cancer is such a complex and heterogeneous disease and how it adapts to its environment in ways that we can take advantage of for treatment. And finally, to conquer cancer, we have to use this foundational knowledge, such as I've told you about, identify new targets for treatment. We've identified many now in these metastatic cancers and understanding that these breast cancers can reprogram to this neural crest state, which you don't normally see in an adult, and also to use the adaptive mechanisms within our body, such as Sue Keck talked about, harnessing the immune system in order to target these cells as well, because we'll never use one drug or one strategy in order to conquer these very adaptive cancers. So with that, I want to finish. I want to thank all the people in the lab and our funding and our collaborators. And now I want to introduce you to Danny Engel. You've seen her picture here for a long time. In fact, this picture has been up since she was a graduate student. But I think it's so impressive that we just keep it here. And now you're going to hear another free talk right now by Danny Engel. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and to all of you for coming and spending your afternoon here with us at the Salk. And I'm very excited to be back here. This, these were, um, the Salk is very dear to my heart. These were um, where I formed my critical thinking ability, where I learned how to be a scientist, and where I learned to tackle very difficult problems. And because I uh, grew up as a scientist here at the Salk, we have a very unique opportunity to kind of tell you about that journey, how to become a scientist, especially how to become a good scientist. And so many of you may think that if you're going to become a scientist, you have to start at an early age. You have to have uh, plans from the time that you're born or when you, you know, your grandfather becomes involved and tries to make your uh, son into a graduate student. But like, you know, we don't have to start um, at birth with this path to become a scientist. In fact, I didn't. And so my own journey actually started 
um, as Cheryl said, at Northwestern, where I started not as a biology major, but as a musician. So I actually was accepted at Northwestern to be a music major, and I had no idea that I was going to become a scientist until I really fell in love with genetics. And I fell in love with genetics studying, of all organisms, the fruit fly, which many of you are always trying constantly to kill and to get rid of, <laughs> but for me is a very interesting model organism. And what I was very interested in was understanding how this balance between life and death leads to these complex, intricate patterns that are essential for life. And so you can see here, very simply, a fruit fly has hairs. It's covered in hairs, and this is how it senses its environment. And if you dysregulate development, you no longer have neat and tidy rows of hairs. They're all a mess. They look disheveled. But you might wonder, is that really a big deal? They can live without neat and tidy hairs. However, it's also very important for their wings. And if they don't have properly patterned wings, they can't fly, they can't live, and they can't survive, let alone reproduce. So it's very important that these developmental balances between life and death are carefully orchestrated and controlled. And ultimately, when I became a graduate student, I wanted to understand how loss of regulation of this intricate balance of life and death caused cancer. And so because Jeff showed funny photos of me, I went back and found a funny photo of Jeff. And so this is Jeff <laughs> in his prime uh, as a scientist. He had more hair. <laughs> but um, he basically taught me all, everything I know about development and cancer and basically gave me my foundational knowledge to tackle big problems. And the first problem that I wanted to understand was mammary gland development, development of the breast, and how that related to cancer. And so that was the beautiful story that you just heard from Jeff um, that I was involved with as a graduate student. And so the next phase after you earn your PhD is to actually go on as a postdoctoral fellow to another lab. And of course, I chose to move to England. And moving from San Diego to England, let me tell you, you immediately become vitamin D deficient. But here I was able to actually develop my um, ability to accurately model cancer. And this is incredibly important, because if we don't have good models, how are we ever going to answer our questions? We certainly can't do experiments on people. That would not be ethical. But at the same time, we don't want to use models that will give us false ideas or artifacts or mislead us into thinking that something would be a good idea and have that be harmful to a patient. So during my fellowship, I really focused on figuring out how to make our models more accessible to the entire community and how to make them more accurate. And so during my fellowship, I really focused on these things called organoids, which I'll give you a little bit more information about later, but also making better mouse models. And so we can use these mouse models as avatars to basically figure out how every single patient's cancer is unique and to make sure that lessons that we learn from these models can also be applied to human beings. And during my postdoc, I chose to study one of the the most difficult cancers, pancreas cancer, which is right here. How many of you know where the pancreas is? <laughs> no. Yes, yeah, so a few of you do know. It's right next to your stomach, um, very far back. And so it's also about the size uh, of an iPhone, which is where that that's a size reference now. But you can see that it's actually one of the most deadly cancers because this tiny little sliver of orange shows you how many people live after they're diagnosed with pancreas cancer. Barely any at all. So it's about 99% lethal in all cases. And there are many horrible, horrible cancers out there, but this one is universally a death sentence. And so I study pancreas cancer because it's a horrible problem. Um, and this is a typical course of a pancreatic cancer patient. And so this might seem incredibly anonymous, right? So like your doctor tells you all these words and figuring out what these words mean is very difficult, but this is a, a typical course. And so I'm just gonna take you very quickly through it so you can kind of understand it from, from the perspective of a patient. And so these patients are often diagnosed with misregulated glucose um, levels in their blood, so diabetes. Um, this often precedes the diagnosis. And if a patient is lucky, in about one out of 10 cases, they'll be eligible for surgery. And if they're that lucky and their, their tumor is removed, they have a chance. And so these patients' tumors are removed, and then a few months later, they'll start receiving chemotherapy. 
And chemotherapy, it doesn't just hit the cancer, it hits all cells in your body. There are many horrible side effects, and we never know which chemotherapy is gonna work best for that patient. But in this case, this patient received a combination of two chemotherapies called cisplatin and gemcitabine, words that are really meaningless unless you actually look in the literature and figure out what they hit, but they really hit cell division and DNA replication, right? And so these never cure a patient. These are something that might slow down a cancer or trip it up a bit, but inevitably the cancer will come back and they'll get another round of either chemotherapy or radiation therapy. Now, all of this is basically attempting to improve quality of life because there's very little that we can do for these patients at this point. In fact, they start acquiring other conditions, which include paralysis of your gastrointestinal tract, which means they can no longer digest food, and accumulation of fluid in their abdomen, which can be treated but always comes back and causes severe pain. But inevitably, about 14 months later, the patients that had metastatic cancer at the time of surgery, they die. And this is despite the fact that, you know, we can't find it early, but we know that this patient actually had cancer five years before their diagnosis. We just had no idea where it was or how to kill it. And so the reason why I study this cancer is that, as you can see, it's a very horrible disease. This is something that has plagued families and patients for quite some time, including my own. This is my father. Right. So... The only cure for pancreas cancer is still surgery. And this is a surgery that by itself carries a mortality rate of 5 to 10% if you're not at a high volume center. And the reason why it's so difficult is because it's not just removing a pancreatic tumor, it's reconnecting all the pieces that are removed in the process. And so this pancreatic surgery was actually incredibly life-saving and incredibly ambitious when it was first developed by Dr. Whipple. And so it's also known as the Whipple procedure. And so this procedure to remove a tumor not only removes the pancreas, but also a section of your gut, your gallbladder, and then all of these pieces have to be reconnected. Right? So this procedure by itself can take eight hours. And um, also, a lot of these patients are what we call an open and close. And so we are really not very good at finding metastases in these patients. And so what ends up happening is that a surgeon will open a patient find a metastasis in the liver and have to close them back up without removing the tumor. Because once you have metastatic pancreatic cancer, this does no good for your patient. It just makes it more difficult to get them healthy enough to give them chemotherapy. And in the end, what this means is that there's a huge difference in survival depending on whether or not you have surgically removable cancer or if you have metastatic disease. So if you have metastatic pancreatic cancer, which is stage four, your median survival is four and a half months. And so what that means is that half of every patient, basically 50% of pancreas cancer patients with stage four disease will die faster than that. And so those are the stories you hear about people passing away within weeks. And that's half of all metastatic pancreatic cancer patients. And that's actually half of all the patients that we see in the clinic. So the other thing I'll point out is that even if you have surgery, only in one out of five chances do you actually cure that patient. Because in four out of five cases, they actually already have metastatic disease, and we just couldn't see it. We couldn't find it through our MRI scans or through our CT scans. And so that meant that that surgery really did that patient no good. But it was, only, it was the best chance that they have, and so that survival rate is less than two years. And so what can we do for our patients with metastatic cancer? And so recently, and by recently, I mean within the past 10 years, we've come out with two different chemotherapy regimens. And so this is just a combination of different chemotherapy that hits all the cells in your body. And this will extend survival for these patients by two to three months and also improve their quality of life. But you can see that really everybody dies. And what that paints is a very poor picture in that the number of new cases of pancreatic cancer is increasing every year, but we're not impacting survival at all. And so you can see that this blue line is the number of new cases, and this red line is the number of deaths that are happening every year in the United States, and there is no separation between them, and they are not changing. And so we haven't been able to impact patient care for those patients that have pancreas cancer since we first started keeping records in the 1970s. And so how do you tackle a problem that is so huge and so personal? Well, 
the first thing you need to do is to convince more people to study this problem, because we're always better when we work as a team. And the problem is that studying pancreas cancer used to be incredibly difficult. We didn't have good models. It was very difficult to access patient samples because so few of our patients went to surgery. So what do you do? You lower the energy of acti activation, and you make a new model. And so this is my work for my fellowship, where I basically created a three-dimensional culture system where we could take samples from even metastatic pancreatic cancer patients and grow their tumors in a dish in three dimensions. And so what you can see here are these little domes. And so this is a 10 centimeter dish. So these little domes, they're pretty small, but each one of them contains embedded within them organoids. And these organoids are isolated from different patients. And if you actually just tilt the plate, you can see these little tiny circles within each of these domes, which if you blow up, you can see these individual balloon-like structures, which are isolated from a tumor. And so each of these structures is about one millimeter to five millimeters, and they can grow forever, just like a cancer can. And the nice thing is that whenever you want to do another experiment or you want to ask a different question, you just grow more, and you will never run out. Unlike a blood sample or a tumor sample from a patient, that once it's gone, it's gone, and you can never use it again. So this is what we call a living biobank, a renewable biorepository, so that anybody anywhere in the world that wants to ask a question using this model, I can cryopreserve it, mail it to them, and they can thaw it and ask questions in their own laboratory. And so this has really enabled anybody uh, to study this disease, even if they're not next to a hospital, even if they don't have uh, enough money to generate these models themselves, we've basically made this uh, more available to the community so that everybody can start asking questions. And so what can you do with organoids? Well, as I mentioned, you can make organoids um, from tumor tissue from a, from a pancreas cancer patient. You can also make them from a biopsy. And then you can actually start doing what we call iterative studies. And so after you make an organoid, you can actually just look at it and say, can I learn anything about the molecular subtype? So, um, very similar to what Jeff was talking about, there's a few rare types of pancreas cancer that have targeted drugs that we can basically figure out whether or not that patient would benefit from them. You can also put that organoid into a mouse and figure out, well, if I can cure this mouse, can I cure that patient? And you can also do very large-scale drug screening, so empirical testing. What drug works the best for that particular patient's cancer? And as I mentioned, when you can make an organoid from a biopsy, it means that you can make an organoid from all pancreas cancer patients, even the 85% that have stage four metastatic disease that will never go to surgery. You can actually get a very small piece of a biopsy, so this is like you know, a string of hair, and that's enough to make an organoid. And you can see that this is where the needle went through this patient's tumor, and we're able to see uh, organoid growth um, and have enough organoids to start doing drug testing within four to six weeks. So these organoids, when they grow, you can see them coming together. You can see them actually moving and migrating towards each other because they support each other's growth. You can see them blowing up like little balloons. And so that is happening in the course of a few days. And so within a few weeks, we're able to grow enough to start doing therapeutic testing. So what kind of impact can having this a priori knowledge about the best drug for a patient mean for a patient with stage four disease? And so this is one of our very first organoid lines, HF2. And what we found is that this patient's organoid line was incredibly sensitive to two chemotherapies, but incredibly resistant to three. And so basically, blue means sensitive, and red means resistant, and gray means just average. And so in the beginning, this patient was actually given a drug that they were resistant to and two average drugs. And so this is showing you CT scans, which is basically how we follow the tumor volume um, in the patient after treatment. And the first thing that you can see here is in green are all the tumor sizes. And the first thing you'll notice is that on this resistant therapy treatment, all of her tumors grow. They don't just grow, they triple to double in size. But then she's rapidly switched to two drugs that she's exquisitely sensitive to and immediately responds. In fact, some of her metastases completely disappear and never reappear. And so the median survival at this stage of cancer is 180 days, and she lived 1,022. 
right? But she still passed away. What else can you use these organoids for? And probably the most powerful thing that you can use them for, even though precision medicine of patients is incredibly important, is making those foundational discoveries that changes how we look at cancer and how we approach it. So one of the first things that I want to talk to you about is the fact that a pancreatic tumor is unique in this one particular way. So if any of you have gotten a uh, cut or a scratch that formed a scar, you know that when you run your hand over your skin, you can feel the stiffness of the tissue. You can feel that that scar has a different tenseness than the rest of your skin. It's harder. The same thing happens in a pancreas when it has an injury. And a tumor is basically the same thing as a wound. And so when you have a cancer, for some reason, the pancreas has a remarkable response to this cancer. It forms one of the most profound stromal scars that is observed in disease. And so what I mean by that is that it recruits these cell types called fibroblasts. And there are multiple types of fibroblasts. There are some that are responsible for secreting extracellular matrix, which make it very stiff and very hard and difficult to penetrate. And there are others that actually tell the immune system that there's nothing to see here. Move along. And both of these types of fibroblasts basically make the pancreas tumor quiet and undetected, and also very difficult to get drug into. So that even if you're treating a patient with high doses of chemotherapy, you will kill that patient before it even reaches cytotoxic levels in that tumor. And on top of it, it reprograms your immune system so that it's completely able to evade any sort of immune response. And so this is a cartoon of what is happening. This is an actual um, specimen from a human pancreatic cancer. And this is the, these are little islands of cancer cells. And all this swirly pink stuff, that's the scar. And that's what we have to get through every time we're treating these patients with chemotherapy. And so the nice thing about organoids is that, yes, the organoids themselves are just these islands of cells, but you can recreate that scar. You can add those same cell type, those fibroblasts that are making extracellular matrix to the organoid cultures so that you're growing the cancer cell, but right next to it, you're also growing those fibroblasts. And intriguingly, those fibroblasts and those cancer cells, they don't exist in isolation. They touch each other, and they communicate with each other, and they change each other. They make it more difficult to kill. And that's both through physical barriers and also signals that they're sending each other. So in this case, the green cells, these are the cancer cells. And like a, a spider web, you can see that these fibroblasts are forming a network and in close contact with these cancer cells. And we've found that they're able to change the response to chemotherapy, that they can prevent the delivery of chemotherapy, and even in the face of completely hostile conditions, keep these cancer cells alive. So that when you actually look at the organoids when they're grown together with these stromal scar, you can see this light pink stuff just like you see in this tumor section. And so we're, re we're able to recreate that process with high degrees of accuracy. And now we can start asking questions about, well, do we need to hit both of these targets? Do we need to target the scar tissue as well as targeting the cancer? And then finally, what I'm going to tell you next is basically um, one of the major areas of focus on my lab. And that's basically how a cell knows to live or to die. And so we're going back to this very basic process that uh, I started off by um, understanding in fruit flies and in the mouse mammary gland with Jeff, and then finally now in the organoid model systems. And so the traditional view of cancer is that it is a, uh, something where we have both the gas pedal jammed down and we've lost our brakes. Okay? And so in cancer, what happens is that you have mutations in our genetic code, our DNA, and this, if it happens in an oncogene, sends all of these signals to grow. But you still have your brakes, and your brakes can keep this cancer in check and from becoming a problem. But if you have another mutation, this time in something that we call a tumor suppressor, which are the brakes, and you lose that signal to die, now that signal from the oncogene can become malignant and invade and metastasize. And you can treat these cancers with chemotherapy, but in the end, you might slow down the growth rate, 
but you will never completely eliminate the disease. So what do I study? I actually study something completely different from DNA mutations, um, probably to the horror of my PhD mentor who discovered the guardian of the genome. But I actually study sugars. And it turns out that sugars can actually be added to these oncogenes and these tumor suppressors. And without a single change in your genetic code, it can turn on or off function. So just by changing the sugar on this protein, you can start accumulating more signals to grow. And by changing the sugar modification on the brakes, you can actually get rid of the signal to die. And while this is terrifying and that now you have an unchecked tumor growing, it actually offers you a unique opportunity because these sugars are very easily recognized by the immune system. And so if we can go in with both chemotherapy and an antibody that recognizes that change to the sugar, we've actually shown in some mouse models that we can eliminate the tumor altogether and we can restore the ability of the immune system to see your cancer and to kill it. And finally, um, the major area of focus of my lab is how we use these sugar changes to actually find the cancer earlier. And so this is very important because certain patients that have chronic inflammation have a 55% lifetime risk of developing pancreatic cancer. And right now, they're just told to sit and wait. There's nothing that they can do that's been shown to actually increase their likelihood of finding the cancer before it kills them. But what we can do is look in the blood. And right now, most of our blood-based tests look at changes in proteins. But what I've found is that if you actually look at changes in these sugars, which can also modify the function of these proteins, you can now discriminate patients that just have inflammation, which will naturally resolve and they'll be fine, and patients that have aggressive stages of pancreas cancer, as well as the earliest stages of pancreas cancer when they can be cured by surgery. And so this is what I joined at the SALK. Uh, this is my mission, and this is actually um, month three for me of being an assistant professor. So I do want to take um, the last few minutes to thank all of you for coming. I'd be happy to take your questions. But I've also had amazing mentorship over my career, starting with my undergrad, Bob Holmgren, of course, Jeff Wall here at the Salk, and during my uh, postdoctoral fellowship, David Tuvison. And I've also had several uh, different um, funding sources that have believed in this project from the beginning, including the Pancreatic Cancer UK Foundation and the Lusgarten Foundation. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Good talk. So that and everybody can hear the question as well as the answer, please raise your hand and I'll be happy to uh, pass the mic around. Um, unless they explained everything and nobody has any questions. Okay. You mentioned that one of the early signs was diabetes. Yes. Is that attached to the, to the sugar? Yes, so, you, so it's a very good question. Um, so it's not directly related, I would say, to the changes in glycosylation you see on proteins, the sugar modification of pr proteins. But actually what happens in the early stages of cancer is that this giant wound in your pancreas disrupts the islets. So the pancreas's normal function is both to produce digestive enzymes, but it's also responsible for producing insulin, right? And so when you have a wound in the pancreas, it prevents its natural ability to make insulin, so you lose your glucose regulation. And so it's really thought that it's basically having that wound in the pancreas that's really kind of um, inhibiting its ability to maintain glucose homeostasis, and that results in, in diabetes. But right now, we don't really know which comes first. We don't know if the, you know, there's something about diabetes and inflammation that's giving a propensity to develop cancer, or if it's the cancer that came first and is causing the diabetes. And so that's still an active area of research. Also, I, I, I'd just like to comment that um, uh, what Danny didn't mention is that um, she's taken on the very challenging uh, goal of developing much better and more effective and accurate ways of detecting and diagnosing pancreatic cancer earlier because that will really change the, uh, the trajectory of treatment success. Okay, I have a question uh, for Danny. Uh, you know, the PSA is used to screen for prostate cancer. Yes. Um, 
Uh, what about uh, developing uh, blood tests to screen for pancreatic cancer? Is that something that you're working on or could be working on? Definitely. So that is an active area of my research. Um, and so even though PSA is somewhat controversial because some people think it gives too many false positives, if you just compare a country that does screening to one that doesn't, like the UK, our mortality rate is about half of the UK. So the impact of a blood test that you use to follow people uh, year after year is profound. And so for, for pancreas, it's been complicated by the fact that there's certain conditions in the pancreas that look very similar to cancer, but are completely benign. And so they have an extraordinarily low mortality rate. And it turns out those benign conditions have a five-fold higher incidence. So now we're starting to play a numbers game where you have to start thinking about false positives and false negatives, because you don't want to tell a person they have cancer um, unless they actually do. And so um, I actually approached this problem by using the organoids to come up with biomarker candidates and then testing them in the blood. And so that's basically um, what I've been spending um, a significant portion of my time sitting at my lab is actually getting the clinical specimens ready to validate some of the candidates I identified in organoids. Exactly. Why the increase in pancreatic cancer? So it's a very good question. Um, there are many things that are probably involved from diet to exercise. Um, so if you also think about what the normal function of the pancreas is, it can very easily accidentally digest itself. And so a lot of the risk factors for pancreas cancer include obesity, uh, alcohol consumption, and also we don't know a lot about how our changes in diet are affecting the normal function of the pancreas. So I don't think that we actually know the answer to that question yet. And it's really going to require a lot of epidemiological studies in order to sort it out, for sure. Interestingly, some of the risk factors for pancreas cancer are also those, the same as risk factors for breast cancer, yes. obesity, and alcohol consumption. And in addition, there are genetic factors that give a predisposition to breast cancer that also give a predisposition to yes. pancreas cancer. So this is one of the things, if I can take you back to Ruben's um, comments that as we learn things about one cancer, they actually uh, relate to other cancers as well. Studying one makes us smarter about studying all. Yes. Thank you both for giving very um, educational and interesting um, and understandable lectures. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you actually just touched on part of what my question was, that is it the combination, can, can you have cohorts of, of the epidemiology and then also look at those who may be at more en environmental risks yes. and combine them and then see over overlaps with, with other oncology issues as well. Yeah. So the issue of gene-environment interactions becomes increasingly important as well. So... Um, and and is, our, is our country or, or Western civilization showing higher signs yes. than perhaps others. Yeah, and there, there are several kinds of studies that tell us that, uh, for example, the Western diet is really bad. It's very bad. <laughs> um, and one of the ways that we can know this is that, for example, uh, as people have come to our country from other places, we can do experiments exactly like you're talking about. What is the incidence of cancer in their country of origin? And then what is the incidence of cancer in the same population when they move here. The Japanese are a perfect example of this. They have very, they have kind of higher incidence of liver cancer and very, very low incidence of breast cancer. They move here, their breast cancer incidence goes up dramatically. If you've seen pictures of China recently, uh, I gave a talk once where I showed um, the rate of increase in the number of McDonald's, Jack in the Box, and those other kinds of fast food restaurants, the increase in obesity and the increase in breast cancer, and they all go together. Thank you. There's a question over there. Oh, sorry, we have another I, one over here. One more question for you, um, and a, a side version. Rather than the science, I'm interested in the politics and the economics of cancer research. Obviously, cancer is a major issue in this country. And there is a lot of funding going into cancer research, and as you so eloquently stated, there is not enough looking at metastatic disease as a key component of it. I'm curious because SOC is obviously a bastion of science and knowledge and vision, which is fantastic, but you also have the collaboration and the relationships to have 
access to the clinical cases you right. would need. And how difficult is it to have a creative, novel approach embraced by others in the oncology world, either clinical or research, and how important is it to stand apart in terms of having independent funding for breakthrough thoughts as you have? Okay, so let me unpack that. There are a few different issues. The first thing you commented on was funding for cancer research. And um, we have a cancer advocate in our lab who I didn't thank personally, but she's up there. She's actually a breast cancer survivor. And she and I have worked very hard on funding for cancer research. And let me explain to you why. From what Ruben said and from what you've heard from us, what fraction of people, I ask you a question, do you think in the United States will have a cancer experience in their lifetime? What fraction? Anybody want to guess? I would say at least 90%. Right, 100%. It's a disease of aging, we're living longer. Each of us, the word cancer experience is the important thing. Danny is profoundly impacted by the cancer experience she had with her dad, which actually happened while she was in my lab. Um, and so I became affected by that as well. Um, now, how many people are there who live in the United States? 340 million. 340 million, 100% of them are gonna have a cancer experience at one time or another. Now, how much money do we put into cancer research? That's your real question. How much money per year do we put into the National Cancer Institute? 5.4 billion. So if you do the math, if you've been to Starbucks recently, it's between three and four medium-sized lattes. If you get stuff added to it, it's probably more like two and a half per person per year. Per year. Two cups of coffee per year for a disease that's going to affect all of us, the economic burden of which is orders of magnitude more than the investment. I'll give you an example. Pancreatic cancer. We used to spend more on, I'm going to call it an ineffect, palliative drug, palliative drug. We used to spend more per year on a palliative drug, a non-curative drug, than we did on all of pancreatic cancer research five years ago, ten years ago. Then the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network uh, got a very strong lobbying arm, and now at least that's changed. And now people like Danny can be empowered to do the very creative work that she's doing to tackle the problems that are really important. Earlier diagnostics, more effective treatment, development of strategies that can be disseminated to the entire community for, for cooperative, collaborative, creative work. Okay, so that's the unpacking of the first one. The second one, uh, physicians and scientists are working together all the time, all the time. We have a, so we're fortunate to live in San Diego. The, this Mesa has two of the seven or eight NCI designated National Cancer Institutes. Salk was the first one, Sanford Burnham is the second one. And one of the, um, 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 uh, comprehensive uh, cancer centers at Moore's Cancer Center. Okay? Uh, we both collaborate with Andy Lowy, who's a pancreatic cancer surgeon, and you saw Danny put the, you know, her lab mates up there. Well, actually, one of them is her husband, Irv Teriak, who helped to de develop this organoid system. We have a grant in right now with Irv and Andy to the pedal to cause bike ride, which raises independent money for cancer research because we actually can't trust the government every year to fund it at an adequate level, okay? So collaboration, cooperation, independent funding within this area, and of course, there's the Conquering Cancer Initiative at the Salk that will empower us even more. I hope I've answered your question. Okay, this is gonna be the last question that we have before our reception. Um, Jeff and Danny have uh, graciously agreed to give generously of their time, so they will still be here to answer other questions, but um, just I'm keeping us, trying to keep us on schedule a little bit. So there, was there? We're actually enthusiastic about staying around okay. and talking yeah. with you. We really want to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, very informative and educational. Uh, I had a loved one that passed away from ovarian cancer, and uh, one of the problems that I've learned over the years is early detection, yep. how, how big a problem it is. I have a daughter in Australia, and I know the Ovarian Cancer uh, Association over there is spending 
their monies uh, that they collect on early detection. I just thought, anything you've talked about, and is there a crossover to ovarian cancer? Well, definitely some of the genetic predispositions. So, for example, BRCA mutations, um, when they're inherited, they don't just increase your risk for breast cancer, but also ovarian and pancreas. So there's a lot of related um, things that we can learn from you know, breast and pancreas cancer and apply to ovarian. Ovarian cancer also has the stromal scar, which also needs to be targeted for effective therapy. And so the nice thing that, uh, about being at the Salk and being in San Diego is that you know, I, you know, we're looking forward to collaborating with people studying other diseases. Um, in fact, we've also started making organoid models um, with the NCI to, to tackle exactly that problem where we're trying to make organoid models also from lung, liver, ovarian, and colorectal cancer patients. And so we're trying to apply basically kind of like the tools that we've learned in studying the pancreas to make it also more tractable to study other cancers, including ovarian. So ovarian is one of the five that we're studying. The point that you raise is very important about early diagnosis. So let, let me say one other thing. Let's not think about early diagnosis. Let's think about wise diagnosis. And the reason I use that word is because um, there will be many women who are diagnosed with breast cancer, 60% who have ductal carcinoma in situ. In other words, it's a cancerous conversion, but the cancer is contained. Um, it hasn't spread yet. It's still in the duct. It hasn't moved outside, like I showed you. It's gotten into a blood vessel. 60% of the women who are diagnosed with that condition will not need any treatment. If you were to watch them, statistically, if you were to watch them, they won't progress. It's really the 40% who need treatment. But everybody will be treated because we don't know which is which. So that's why I say it's not only early, but it's wise. How do we know who's going to progress? No clue, but we're trying to develop some systems that will actually look at that. The other thing, is that, um, I gotta tell you, um, I've heard Danny talk a number of times, but when she spoke today, I don't know, maybe it was the way that she spoke, but she gave me a really great idea for a collaborative <laughs> experiment. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> well, thank you both. Please help me felt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I encourage you to come down and speak with them individually. Also, please join us for reception in the lobby. And uh, again, thank you for your support. And we hope that you're half as enthusiastic as we are about the prospect and the optimism that we have here to make progress in cancer. Thank you.